Hi, I'm Morgante Pell. I'm the lead engineer at cafe.com, and I'm going to be talking about a super simple introduction to JavaScript. Um, yeah. So just to dive right in, JavaScript's a um, quasi-functional, quasi-imperative uh, programming language, um, which allows most sort of C-like language constructs. So you can do things like have variables, like var x equals 10. You can do things like have functions, like function hi. You can do something like say, uh, say hi. So that declares a function, and I can call hi, and it says hi. Now you'll notice one thing I importantly did here is console.log. Right here I'm in the console dev environment. Um, console dev environment is a the, with the webmaster tools, which is kind of with Chrome. Um, every major browser has some variant of this. Safari has its own developer tools. Firefox has Firebug as well as built-in de developer tools. Even IE these days has some developer tools. Uh, I don't know anyone who regularly uses them as their developer tools, but they can do, they can do it. Um, so in this console dev environment, you can access any of the variables that are available on the page in the global scope, as well as creating your own variables. Like I had my variable x that I declared up there. So if I just hit x, it did 10. And another important thing to note about this environment, which is I find actually pretty interesting, is it does anything it converts any, um, anything that you put onto the line to a string and then prints that out. So if I do hi there, which is the function I declared, it's converting my function to a string. And the default implementation of converting a function to a string is just to print out the entire function. Now, if you want to mess around with things a little bit, you can actually redeclare these. So you can say, um, you can change x, x's um, uh, to string. Right, so how that's going to be converted to, to a string to do something like to create a function there, which say returns 11. Um, so now if I do x, it does not. Oh, yeah, I had to do the um, earlier here. That unfortunately x is already <laughs> declared there. Um, essentially, but what you're doing is you're constantly your console log you're printing out anything into this console. So cons that's frequently used any JavaScript development. It's your equivalent of like the print statement in most other languages or echo or anything like that. Um, so if I want to do console.log um, test this. Now, JavaScript is primarily used as a way to d manipulate web pages and integrate interactive features into web pages. So a really useful tool for doing that is jQuery. Um, you can do everything with raw JavaScript, but jQuery makes things a lot simpler, and in many cases helps you deal with like cross-browser compatibility. Um, it's very rare that you'll see a major website that doesn't have some form of jQuery on the page. So jQuery's um, main function is this um, dollar sign here, and this dollar sign basically is a way of accessing any part of the any part of the DOM. Um, so if I want to say remove every image on the page. Right? So image tags are IMG. So this will select every image tag on the page. You can see we've got all these here. And I can do something like um, hide them all. And you'll see up here, all the image tags on the page were hidden, just with that one simple little command, because jQuery went throughout the DOM tree, removed all the images ta image tags, and then manipulated them. Um, I can get them back very simply with just show. Um, and you see, we're just calling functions on them. Um, how jQuery works is that if you call a function on a selector like that, it calls that same function on every on every element in there. So the, even though image is kind of an array, this right here is a sort of an array-like construct. You have 14 elements on it. Um, it automatically goes through and basically does a for each on each, each of them and does show or hide or the equivalent there. Um, you can also do things like manipulating um, there are attributes, um, so they're like CSS attributes. So you can do like CSS, um, display none. So that's the equivalent of hiding them. Um, obviously, we want to display them block most of the time. Now we can, but you can also do even more cool things with this. So you can say set the opacity of them.
So, um, and you notice here I'm just passing an object into the CSS one, which is just a list of rules. So we're let's put it up to like 0 0.5. Um, and this is just a list of CSS rules. If you ever use CSS, it's just a way of having styles applied to the page. Um, most web pages that you go to will have jQuery on it. Um, they don't necessarily have it available in the, in the global scope, um, but it's a, I actually think it's one of the most fun ways to start getting an introduction to JavaScript is just go around to different web pages and play with them by um, trying to open up the dev console and um, pulling things out of them. So you can do things like um, manipulate, manipulating the context of the web pages, um, finding elements on the page. So here's this most popular one. All right, so we want to change that to say, you know, we're, we're making like a funny joke. Um, so first we want to have the selector for it. So H1 was popular there. And um, we want to change like the text of it. Now jQuery has a nice built-in function for changing text. Text just pass it. If we, um, sorry. If we don't pass anything to it, it just returns the text. Um, uh, if we, but if we do pass anything into that function, it acts as a getter, as a setter rather than a getter there. So if we do change it to um, craziest, let's say, because we think that's much more accurate than most popular, there we can maybe put that web page right in place. Um, now, as I said, Jake, um, JavaScript is most useful, especially for um, adding interactivity to pages. So we can do something like add a click handler so that when we click this, we will be able to actually have something happen. Um, a click handler works by, on the, you can add, you're adding an event handler and you're passing a function that's called whenever that event happens. So here we're gonna create a function just inline, um, which says clicked, just prints clicked to the console. Very simple function. And then if I go up here and click on that, you'll see it says clicked. Um, we can also change that to do a, an alert, which is a much more user um, visible form of printing something out um, or displaying something. So here you've got this big alert that appears on the page, clicked. Um, that's just that's just the built-in um, JavaScript alert function, which displays that to the user. Um, now there's a lot more that you can do with this. There's a lot, constantly whenever you're using the web, whenever you're interacting with pages, there's dozens to hundreds of different events firing. Um, so you can add them to all kinds of things. So you can add them to the window. Um, and every time you resize the window, we can do something. So um, adding in a function here. And these are anonymous functions. So one of the major powerful features of JavaScript is that you can very easily and cheaply create functions. You don't have to name every function. You don't have to like pass, like create a function up there and pass it in. You can just anonymously have a function in line right there. Um, so we'll say resized, um, and this is creating an event for when we re resize the window. Now I realized I'm in like a full screen mode here, so it's hard to resize the window. Um, but let's see. So there, when we exited full screen, it called the resized function because obviously exiting full screen is a form of resizing the web page. Um, and then every time I resize this, see, in those, it's also calling it multiple times. Um, you know, do, like dozens of times. Just even though I haven't even let go of the mouse, I'm resizing it. So a big danger that you can get into with JavaScript is that you have things calling so many times um, that it can overload the web page. There's a lot of issues with JavaScript performance that way. Um, so you want to do things like setting that things call an interval. Thankfully, JavaScript has a really great, um, in the standard library, it has a built-in function for setting things up to be called an interval, just send interval. Um, and what that does is it calls a certain function on a certain interval, and it doesn't, um, it doesn't call it any less than that interval. So if I want to say console.log high, I want to do that. Um, so the first argument to set interval is the actual function. In this case, I'm doing an anonymous function again. Um, you can do that to set the call that on the interval. It's the second argument is the time that you want to call it on. So in this case, a thousand um, times in JavaScript are set in milliseconds. All times in JavaScript are milliseconds. Um, so that will 
sorry, for dot a. There we go. Um, so you see this is calling every second now. It's printing the console, hi. Um, and if I do this, you'll see it keeps printing it on. Um, you can also do a singular form of set interval, which only gets called once, is set timeout. So it'll be called first time, but it won't be called subsequently after that. Um, once, right in here. So this one will be called once, but you're seeing it's not getting piled up like in the future. Now, throughout this, I've been using anonymous functions in JavaScript. So the syntax for anonymous function is this. Um, you basically you just don't have any name on it. So, um, now, right. Now, what you can alternately do is have a um, function that is named. So this is a named function. So, and a name function provides that name into the global scope. So, according to whatever scope it's declared in. So, name function is now available, and I can pass it into anything, anything else where it takes a function like set interval, set timeout, any of these event handlers. Um, but the other option that I have is actually to assign things to a variable. A, fun a variable in JavaScript can contain a function. So, I can do um, their xfunc equals um, an anonymous function. So we're creating an anonymous function here and putting it into the x function call. Um, so x function, same way that we, as if it was a name function, x function now works. Um, now, this is maybe not so interestingly useful for this immediate case right here. But it is how you start to build up sort of class-like functionality in JavaScript when you want to have like a set of functions that are available in a certain in a certain sort of namespace or object. Um, in JavaScript, you can create those through having an object. Um, so we want to have this be you know class example, and it just has like three functions that say say hi, say bye, or something. So hi will be one function. Um, Right? And we can have another function on there, which is by. Um, and again, the same way that we were putting assigning these functions to a variable above with the um, x function, this is just assigning them to those variables within that within that um, object. Or if you're coming from the Python background, you can think of this as a dictionary. Um, so we can have by here. And now both of those functions are available within that class example. So um, so there. See, we're able to say hi, bye. Um, so one of the, and this is like ways that you can start to group functions together onto a particular class um, or onto a particular object, which is maybe something that's not as intuitive in JavaScript as it is in other languages, because JavaScript doesn't have the sort of built-in construct of let's just have like a declaring something a class and having a bunch of methods underneath that. We have a related question here. Sure. Is there a difference between assigning function x or x equals function? Yeah, um, there is actually a slight difference. Do you want to uh, repeat the question? Oh, sure. Um, so someone was asking, is there a difference between doing something like this, which is um, x equals certain function, um, so x equals a non function, and function x equals um, function x. So these are both named functions, but the difference is actually in terms of where they're where they're hoisted in the scope. Mm -hmm. um, so it, functions automatically go to the top of the scope that they're declared in. So if you do function x, um, if you are in a certain scope, in this case we're in the global scope, um, but if you do that it would be available even previous lines in your program. So if you had function x, it would be declared available and you were calling it anywhere else, it would be fine. Whereas when you do var x, that's declaring that variable right there, and the function's available right there. So if you have them on that, frequently what you'll see is a pattern is actually doing both simultaneously. Um, people do var x to like make put it into that function, but then also hoist it up um, just so that it's always available. So uh, if you want to learn more about it, you can Google um, function hoisting in JavaScript. It's one of the more interesting things around JavaScript. Um, and 
one other thing that's so we mentioned a little bit around this scope. Um, so we have so how JavaScript scope works um, is you've got every time within a function when you're whenever you're within a function as well as certain other um, less known methods you have a new scope. So here y is available and in the console we're in the global scope. But if we're going to write a function here um, that accesses y, um, it'll be available, right? Um, um, so, sorry. So if we don't do that, y is built, y is printed out. Um, if we change the va value of y, um, so if we change the value of y to be um, by or something, and we call that function, um, sorry. Even though we were changing the value out after the function was declared, it's still reaching into the scope of where, when it was declared to find the y. Now, if we declare a function within a function, if we declare, sorry, a variable within a function, um, say var um, l equals hello, um, and then we call that function, um, but now, we're, so within the function it worked fine, there wasn't any errors that were given to us, but if we try to do something like printing log, printing that variable that we just declared in the function now, we get a reference error because L is not defined in the global scope. It's just defined within that function. Um, so that's, and you frequently will want to do this. It's considered a bad practice in JavaScript to have all of your variables, including the global scope, um, because if they are, any function anywhere on the page, any code anywhere on the page can access it and manipulate it. So usually what you want to do is have very few global variables, or if you, ha if you have to have one for some reason, so there's like expose some functionality, you should only minim expose the minimum functionality required or the minimum API required. Um, so looking at that a little more, um, if we want to look at, so we have this, this variable there, um, L, hello, um, and then we actually could return something. Um, if we want to return L, sorry. <laughs> um, if you want to return L, that can actually work. So Q equals hello. So now Q equals hello, because it was actually, because we were returning L out of that function, we can return a pointer to that scope, to that function within the scope, to that scope, to that variable within our scope, function scope, and make it available in the um, global scope as Q now, or whatever we call that function as. Um, so if we do hello here, that actually returns hello because that's the value of it. Um, now this can get a little tricky in that if you then are changing, the, changing that value, um, so we want to change Q to be something else, right? That does not persist between runs of the function. So because each time we're in the function, it's redeclaring L locally. It's not checking if that's available in the global scope. So that's just a bit of a gotcha that some people sometimes run into. So is, um, yeah. Like if you can't find it in the function namespace, it always looks for it in global? Yeah, exactly. So go, if it doesn't find it in the fun function global space, it will go up to the global space. But um, if you write it in the local space, it will not pull in any global values. It over any Whatever's the most local scope is always what's overriding it. So you override any global values. Um, and you have to be a little careful about that sometimes, um, especially with some of the more important ones. Like, the, um, So the global scope is actually um, on window here. Um, Windows sort of a, if you're doing something like Node Node.js, which is a server-side um, JavaScript rendering environment, that's not going to be available. But in any time that you're in a browser using JavaScript, window is available, and that's actually where you have all these different useful functions available. This is kind of where the JavaScript standard library itself actually lives, um, including things like um, set timeout, um, set interval, set timeout, all of that. Now, one thing that you can start to get kind of tricky with is you can actually override things. Um, you can any, so JavaScript is one of its great features and also one of its pitfalls is you can do kind of um, 
you can do things that are somewhat dangerous and also pretty fun. So here we're going to actually change what set interval does. Um, we're going to say we don't like timers. So anytime anyone tries to change set interval, we're going to say no timers. Um, so that changed what set interval does in the global scope. So if I try to set an interval now, same way that we did before um, with having a function in here. Yeah. There. So we weren't actually able to set a timer. You were, it simply changed, had printed out no timers, and notice we're not saying test every second now. Now we are still saying hi because redefining a function doesn't have any impact on previous uses of that function. Um, so as you go into some more advanced JavaScript, you'll probably end up using this for actually. Um, especially if you're trying to uh, pull in APIs from other people, so if you're trying to like, consume something and then you want to change it in some way, or it's actually how you can also do um, object inheritance in JavaScript, you can have you can inherit some methods, but then redefine some methods locally and have those local methods um, redefine it. Um, I think we've got a couple more minutes here, but um, if you want to look at so every function in JavaScript actually has something called a prototype. Um, so we're doing this function here. And what a prototype is, is sort of the set of additional um, methods and, um, and the variables that are attached to that function. So in many ways, a function in JavaScript is similar to a class in other languages. So hello we've got here, that works fine. But you'll notice here, hello also has this fun little method called prototype. So we can change parts of that. So there's a, there's a bunch of built-in values as well as attaching anything else we want onto there. So we can give function prototype the um, a new method if we want to. So let's say um, by. So this is attaching a function onto that onto that hello function. Um, by. So. Um, Let's just create a variable here, which contains hello. Um, and then we can actually, sorry. Sorry. Um, So it needs to return itself here when we have this function up here. Um, so we, this is a keyword in JavaScript that we, that references the current um, invocation. Um, hello. In this case, since we're not passing anything, it will specify hello. So hello there. All right. Um, and here's where it's printing out window. So um, here we'll have greeting equals hello. And then if we do um, greeting. We can actually call a function again, and then it, every time it does that, it's returning back to the most recent scope. Um, here we're gonna we can have it return the this one. So if we want to do um, and then there's some of these built-in methods that I was talking about for functions. Um, one of them, sorry, some of the built-in methods from jobs for using functions, um, truly useful ones are apply and call, um, which will actually call a function with a particular um, variable scope to this. So we can do something, um, we can call hello with, um, and the first value, the first um, argument that you pass to hello is the variable that you want to be in the, the or what you want this to be overridden as. So we can call hello with hello as this if we want to. Uh, so now you'll see where it's returning this and printing it out. It's actually um, returning itself. So you can kind of cut into some it's, um, slightly silly things there. Um, and then we can also 
actually um, do the same thing with apply. It's just apply takes a set of arguments. Um, and then if we were to do this, um, as I was, so I was saying, we can, we can change the prototype. Um, so we can change things like to change any values on these prototypes if we want to. So we can change to like to string. Um, and that to string can return by. So a lot of these additional methods are available on the to, on the to string. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, so I, I think we're just about out of time. I don't know if there's any questions. Um, one more question. Sure. Uh, what, how do you store data in JavaScript? Sure. Um, <laughs> so storing data simply is just variables. Um, that's your within JavaScript itself. Um, so like persistent data. Yeah. And if you want to have persistent data, there are sort of two ways that you can do it. Um, you can have cookies in JavaScript. So you can set cookies on the page. Um, the API for that's somewhat complicated, but if you Google setting cookies in JavaScript, you can do it pretty easily. Um, more recently, HTML5 has local storage, which allows you to store a lot more data. Um, so you can actually store entire databases in JavaScript. Um, and local storage is sort of a NoSQL style database that's available locally. Um, whereas cookies, you only want to store you know, a couple of characters at most. So the, so the traditional approach is you'd like to store a user cookie that represents the user, and then you go to the server to get any data you need to persist. Um, the newer approach, if you want to have something that has no server at all, you can store data in local storage. And if you look either of those up, there's pretty extensive documentation on how to use them.